This morning we are continuing in our series where we are studying the five practices of fruitful living and giving. Last week we learned that Bishop Snazy was the bishop of the Missouri Conference. And he went throughout his conference and specifically saw that there were five characteristics that vital, thriving, life-giving congregations exhibited when it came to fulfilling their mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Last week, we learned and studied the first practice of what it meant to practice radical hospitality. Now, when we extend the invitation of Christ and when we welcome Christ's presence in our midst, we are exhibiting radical hospitality. But if you've ever thrown a party, you know that that's only part of the equation. Because you have to determine then and there what it is that you are inviting them to. What is it that you are wanting those that you are extending the radical invitation of Christ's love to experience in this place? And so this morning, we're going to spend time studying the second practice, specifically that congregations persistently and consistently adhere to as thriving congregations. And that is the understanding of passionate worship. Now, when we consider passion, we don't have to look very far, given that this is football season. And you can see immediately how passionate people are about their football. Already this year, I have seen grown men cry over difficult and close losses of their favorite teams. I have seen very subdued men and women absolutely snap and lose it jumping up and down, screaming at referees that they believe have made poor calls. We even see those diehard fans that take their shirt off and they paint their chest the color of their favorite team. They will stand in 102, 103 degree temperature heat, and those same diehard fans are also found in the north. But they're even crazier than we are because they will stand in sub-zero temperatures, all in the name of passion. Passion for their team, passion for their game, passion for the love of the sport. We know that in any good relationship and marriage, there's got to be some spice. There's got to be some passion. We know that the best salespersons are people that are passionate about their product. Some people are passionate when it comes to their hobbies. If you uh, follow a band, you will see that inevitably there are groupies and they are passionate about the music. Right now, as a country, we are discerning passion from our future leaders. Who is passionate about the future of America? Whom is it that we will vote, that we will support? Because we know that we too are attracted to the passionate and we will follow those that are passionate leaders. In the book of Revelation, we hear John specifically speak to passion. And he says these words as they're coming from God. You are neither cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. What would it look like if as the body of Christ, we were on fire for God. What would it look like is, it, is, is when we gather in this place, not only that we engage in passionate worship, but that we are so transformed for having been in the presence of the Holy One that we leave this place empowered to be about passionate living with our lives. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Movement, of the Methodist Movement, is attributed with these words. Set yourself on fire with passion, and people will come for miles around simply to watch you burn. When we consider being on fire, where we are taught at a very young age that if you are to ever catch on fire, you're to do three things. And what are they? You're to stop, drop, and roll. Absolutely. This idea to stop, drop, and roll, should you literally catch on fire, 
is to ensure that those flames are extinguished and you are not consumed. Well, this morning, I want to invite us to look at this Isaiah passage. And I want us to look at these three movements not as a means for us to extinguish the flame and the passion of God, but rather for us to fan this flame, fan this passion in such a way that we respond not only with passionate worship, but with passionate living. And so the first movement that we experience in the Isaiah text is that Isaiah stops. He stops. Now, you and I are living life faster than we have probably ever lived it before. In fact, the pace of living continues to increase, and it becomes faster and faster and faster. And when you and I gather for worship, we do not gather simply so we can check it off and fit God into our plans, but rather we gather so that our lives can actually be melded and shaped into God's life. And what we discover is when we gather for worship, we do so thinking less about us and more about God. We become consumed less about our own personal agendas and more focused on God's will for your life and for mine. What we discover when we specifically stop is that we see God in an entirely different light. We know that when Isaiah stops, he does see God entirely different. In fact, in Scripture, he sees the Lord high and mighty above, where the hem of his robe and train fills the entire place. He sees these strange seraphims and winged creatures. He sees smoke all around. He hears these angels calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. And just when you think that's enough, he feels the foundation actually begin to shake underneath his feet. In Isaiah's life, we see that God stops, that God intervenes, that at that moment, Isaiah is aware of the presence of God in a way that he has never been aware of him before. And when you and I come into this place on Sunday morning, when we come and we honor the day of rest that God has set apart for you and me, it reengages our soul. It helps us gain equilibrium and a sense of focus in a world that has the temptation to pull us in so many directions. And by so doing, when we settle our spirits in this place, When we turn our attention upon the almighty God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, we discover that not only do we see God differently, but we cannot help not only seeing God differently, but that we see ourselves differently as well. We see that not only does Isaiah stop in the presence of God, basking in all of God's glory, but when Isaiah captures an understanding of himself in light of the Holy One, he drops to his knees in humility. We hear him cry out, Woe is me! I am a man, a sinful man of unclean lips. And just when he's in that place of I'm doomed, I'm a sinner, there's no hope for me yet, God reminds him as well as God reminds us that God doesn't leave us that way. That God is not done with us yet. And so at that moment, God acts. And God has the seraphim go and pick up a hot coal with tongs and then places it on the very lips that just proclaimed that they were a sinner. And by so doing, he purges the sin, offers an understanding, not only forgiveness of restoration, but an experience of the abundance of God's grace. When Isaiah experiences and gains the right perspective of not only stopping in the presence of God, we, as well as Isaiah, are called to drop to our knees in humility. That we too stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
that we too are unworthy, that left to our own devices, we're going to be sinners and we're going to be egotistical and we're going to be so self-absorbed and we'll run in so many different directions left up to ourselves. But instead, God extends grace to you and to me that says, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not finished with you yet. And when we drop to our knees in humility, we discover not only the perspective of God's abundant grace, but we also gain an understanding of what God calls us to. Several weeks ago, my family and I experienced in a very powerful way what it meant for us to stop and to bask in the presence of the Lord Almighty. We understood what it meant to drop in humility on our knees out of gratitude and thanksgiving for the abundance of God's grace. For uh, several weeks ago, I took my car to Tupelo to the dealership so that I could have the oil changed. I had the tires rotated. I had them realigned. As it was in there, the mechanic told me that I needed some new rotators on the front and gave them the go-ahead. Let's make sure that that happens. And so they had the car all day long. And I went to pick it up probably about 10 minutes before they closed. And sure enough, got on the road, headed back towards home, drove between Tupelo and Columbus, going anywhere between 60 and 70 miles per hour. This is not related to the ticket from last week. (laughs) And I made it safely home, made it safely home. And so the next morning, my family and I were going to go to a football game. So we loaded all of the kids up in the car, uh, we took off, and Rocky said, I'm going to go a new route this time. We're going we're to try to go to the game differently. I said, great. So he's driving, and then he and I become engaged in this deep conversation. And uh, again, we're talking completely consumed with one another. And he looks up and says, uh, I think I might have missed the turn. And so he pulls up his phone just to make sure. He pulls up a Mac, and he said, we did miss the turn. But uh, I can turn up ahead and we can cut through to get back on the main highway and so we turn on this very nice two-lane road and we're driving through and that two-lane road narrows down to a one-lane road and we keep going and that one-lane road turns into a gravel road and so we have moved from driving 60 to 70 down to about 25 to 30 miles per hour And as we're driving on this road, all of a sudden we hear a pop. And Rocky loses control of the car. And we begin to slide on this gravel road. And all of a sudden we find ourselves pushed into the ditch. And Rocky says, I think we blew a tire. We checked. Everybody was safe. Everybody was okay. Rocky jumps out of the car, he looks, and he says, it wasn't the tire. And then he runs around to the other side, and he says, Reagan, it was your tire rod. It came loose, and they didn't put a lock on it yesterday at the dealership. And as he turns towards me, his eyes fill with tears, and he said, we are meant to be in this very moment. This is the provision of God's grace all over us, Reagan. He said, if I had made that turn, we would have been driving 60, 75 miles per hour. If that came out, we would have flipped. We could have killed not only our family, we could have killed somebody else. And as he came over, I grabbed him and I grabbed the kids that were shaken up. And we just prayed and said, God, thank you. Thank you that when we thought that we were on the wrong road, when we turned, when we're off the beaten path, we're reminded... Not that we're off course, but what we were in the very center in the grip of God's grace. And as we pray, not only did we stop at that moment and bask in God's glory, but when we saw what could have been, we hit our knees in humility and gratitude and thanksgiving before God. Now, we were in the middle of nowhere. And so it took a little over two hours to wait for the tow truck to find us, even how to define where we were. So my daughter begins to walk down the gravel road, 
and she begins to fill her shirt up with rocks. And as she fills her shirt up with rocks, she carries them back to me and says, Mom, what should I do with all of these? And being the goofball of a pastor that I am, my response was, when God provides in the Bible, when God ends up saving, when God's presence is made known, people take rocks, just like the ones that you're carrying, and they make altars as a testimony of thanksgiving to the God Almighty. And so in the middle of nowhere, on a dirt, gravel road, my children and I gathered these rocks. And I took out the Bible, and I turned to Joshua, and I began to read about how God helped deliver the Israelites by crossing the Jordan and how they took 12 stones from the middle of that river and how they made altars to be a testimony to God's providential love and grace. And in that moment, with my daughter, with me and my son all on our knees, we, together, made an altar to the Lord out of thanksgiving and praise. My husband says that that wreck changed his life. Changed his life. And I asked him, how? Tell me, tell me how you're different. And he said, I'm not sure. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I know something is significant, that something has changed within me. And what you and I will discover is that when we stop and bask in the glory of God's presence, when we drop to our knees in humility and gratitude for what God has done for you and me, then you and I are compelled to rise and live into the role, not R-O-L-L, -L, but rather role as R-O-L-E. Rise to the role of how you and I are to partner with God in bringing about the kingdom of God in this place. It's interesting that two verses after Isaiah says, Woe is me! I'm a sinner. This is who I am. I'm unworthy. God says, who will go for me? Whom shall I send? And we see that is the action of God calling upon his people to arise and to be different because they have been in the presence of the Holy One. And we see that God is sending Isaiah, not for Isaiah's own sake, God is sending Isaiah for God's own sake. God is calling Isaiah to rise up in such a way that God can use him that shall forever make a difference in your life and in mine. Now, we live in a culture that is all about us. I can go on Nike's website and I can design a shoe exactly how I want it what color I want the swoosh, what color I want the shoestrings, how the design is, what I want it to look like. I can even design the same color that I want on the bottom of the shoe. I can have it the way I want it. If you jump on Amazon Books, they say, we recommend these based upon your purchases because we know what you like. And you're going to like these too. Turn on Netflix. Based upon what you've watched, we know what you like. It's based upon... What you like, your likings. Turn to iTunes. We recommend this music because you will like it. And if we are not careful, church, we can bring that same attitude into worship. And without even knowing it, you and I move into being movie critics rather than coming in as humble servants before the almighty God himself. And so we open the bulletin and we look what songs are going to be sung. And we decide whether or not we like them. We look at the liturgy and see, is it enough liturgy or is it a lack of liturgy? And we make a decision on it. We listen to the choir. Are they good or are they not today? We make a decision on it. We listen to the sermon. And at best we rate it maybe a C plus. And we leave. Having completely missed the point 
of what it means to humble ourselves before the almighty God and King of kings and Lord of lords. And here's the news is that this is not unusual. We see that left to our own devices, our default mode is self. It's always self. When Moses was up on the mountain, we saw that the Israelites got a little concerned, so what did they do? They made an altar according to worship Baal for what Baal could do for them. And as the church and the body of Christ, we've got to be so careful that that is not our perspective and our view because church family, it's idolatry. And the idol is self. It's you. You putting your interests, your desires, your needs in the place above and beyond God's. And the beautiful thing about God is that when we come to worship, God's so gracious that we receive. God's so gracious that as we pour out praise to Him, God fills us with gratitude and abundance of life. Because we cannot be in the presence of the Holy One and see Him differently without seeing ourselves differently. When it comes to worship, I am reminded of these roses. These roses are beautiful. And as we consider what it means to stop, drop, and rise to a roll, we also know there's a saying around roses. Stop and smell the roses. And so as a spiritual discipline, anytime there are roses, if you get here early enough, I will stop and smell the roses. But one thing is for certain is that when I delight in these roses, I bring my attention before them. And I can smell them, and I can touch them, and I can enjoy the gift that they offer simply in the beauty. And I want you to know that when you and I come to worship, it's very similar. We turn our mind's attention and our heart's affection to God. And we hold it there in honor and focus of what the Holy One is doing in this sacred and holy place. Annie Dillard is a Pulitzer Prize author. And she specifically speaks to the power of worship. The power of specifically passionate worship in her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk. And I quote, Why do people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a packaged tour of the absolute? On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or as I suspect, does not one believe a word of it? The churches are like children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear lady straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should latch us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. You see, when you and I take seriously the name that we invoke in this place, when we come offering ourselves to stop in the presence of God, to see ourselves in light of God's glory, then we drop to our knees in humility and we arise with a new understanding of the role that you and I are to play in bringing about the kingdom of God on earth. And when we do that, when we as Christ's children the church get that right, then watch out. Because when you become so passionate and on fire for what God does, then watch out. For people will come from all around simply to watch us burn. So church family, I challenge us to not settle for anything less but passion. 
as we gather in this place to not simply go through the motions, but to be radical in extending God's invitation, to be radical in welcoming the presence of Christ in another, and to be passionate as we worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, God's followers said, Amen.